Hello, this is Jackie with Panama Relocation Tours, and thank you so much for joining us for our weekly Panama Relocation Tour live stream. Today, I have a special guest, Mark Zorel, I think is the right way to pronounce it, is going to be talking about retirement and financial planning for expats. Um, when you become an expat, the whole situation is just a little bit different because, yes, you've quit your job. Um, but you're leaving the country that you used to live in, and there could be other rules. And um, if you're living exclusively on your savings from 401ks or ret retirement plans, you have to make sure that that money is going to last uh, for your retirement in Panama. So we'll go over that in just a little bit. But before I get started with Mark, for the benefit of those of you that are new to our channel, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about who I am. I'm Jackie Lang, the owner of Panama Relocation Tours. In 2010, we started doing uh, six day, seven night, all inclusive tours to go all over Panama to show you what it's like to live in Panama. The whole time the bus is moving, it's like a rolling seminar to teach you about getting your pets into Panama, getting health insurance, how to buy a car, you know, where to get insurance, just finding a rental, all the different things that you need to know to help you have a smooth, hassle-free move to Panama. We're currently doing tour number 192, 192 tours that we've done since 19, uh, uh, since 2010. In addition to that, we do private tours, um, people that know they want to live in a certain area. Sometimes we just do a private tour, uh, one or two or three day private tour of a specific area that you're interested in so you don't have to see the whole country if that's not what you're interested in. We'd love to know where you're from. So if you could please type into the chat area uh, where you're coming in from. So I see people from Miami and Georgia, New Hampshire, Phoenix, uh, from England, California, um, Rhode Island, people from all over the place. So thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'm gonna bring Mark on the screen. Hi, Mark. Thank you so Hi, much for joining us this Saturday. So tell us a little bit of background about Mark and also your company, Plan Vision. Yes, I've been in the financial services industry for 28 years now. Uh, and in, 10 years ago, I uh, left the firm that I started my career with, uh, which is a traditional financial services distribution system, to uh, set up Plan Vision and my uh, attitude at that point was I wanted to work in a, a different capacity with clients a much more direct way. I didn't want to manage their funds, just wanted to help them set up low cost portfolios. And so carve out this niche doing that. Um, and so that started about 10 years ago. And I was also working with small employers on their 401k plans. It's a, bit, a part of my business I subsequently gave up about four years ago. Uh, so I began this practice of working on my own. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a unique model of working in the financial services industry. We just charge a small flat fee for guidance. We do everything virtually. Um, and then clients essentially retain us going forward. Uh, and then what happened was, as I was um, growing this business, business with uh, some former clients and just other clients that we were starting to hear, to hear about, I connected with a, um, a blogger, author, who has a pretty big voice in the expat world. Mm -hmm. He was trying to identify advisors that would help his consumers, I guess, people that were interacting with him, set up uh, simple, globally diversified, low cost portfolios using index funds, which is kind of our approach to, to investing. And Andrew Hallam is the author. And so he began promoting my work to expats. So we had this I, I never expected that I'd be working with all these expats around the world. But yeah. that's I, I, my business, my expat business began to grow fairly rapidly. Right. So I Get ready. With, it's getting ready to grow a little bit more after this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I work with, uh, we were, it's actually myself and some colleagues as well that now work for Plan Vision. So we work with thousands of Americans here and around the world. And we actually work with, um, uh, people from over a hundred countries as well, different nationalities and not in every country in the world, but uh, we've got a lot of countries covered around the world. So that's what we do is to provide investment guidance, how to structure simple, low cost portfolios and um, manage those going forward. We don't manage them, but help our clients do that. And then how to plan for your future. 
how to right. assess where you're at today and then and uh, think about what you can accomplish later. And and so, you know, expats, people moving abroad have some some unique challenges. So that has become a part of our, uh, our of our skill set is understanding to help people how to help people na navigate that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges that expats have uh, when they move overseas? Uh, yeah. You know, as far as their retirement planning and um, investments. Well, on the retirement planning side, they're in some ways intimidated because they, they don't know, like, well, what's going to happen to my accounts? Uh, am I going to be able to like, get dollars? So they, they just have some some things that they're not used to or, or, or they have a bit of a fear about right. and, you, and, and I'm certain as they interact with you, you educate them more about some of those questions. So there's just that uncertainty about what will really happen with my account. So that's one thing that we encounter. Uh, you know, for many people, even if they were lower income earners or maybe higher income earners, they have, by the time they get to be 50, 55, 60, for the most part, many people have a reasonably good sense of how they spend money. Now, right. a lot of people haven't done budgeting and things like that, but they kind of know what they like to spend, even though many times we help talk people through that. Well, if they're going to go to another part of the world, they just they they have a lot of uncertainty about what their expenses are going to be. Now, right. that's a, that that is a part of the appeal for many people in going to other parts of the world. Frankly, it's just... Um, you know, they can they can retire and enjoy life and maybe enjoy a better climate at a much there. The dollar goes so much further. So, yeah, that's you know, that's what that's one of the things about Panama is you can, um, we think, live a much better lifestyle because there, it's just spectacularly beautiful. And you know, except for the rainy season, the weather's beautiful and it's a lower cost of living. But, but what a lot of people think is they're going to be able to take that exact same lifestyle they have in North Carolina and move it down to Panama and live for 50% less. And that's not the, that's not the reality. So um, that's one of the things we do on the tours. We try to go over what's a realistic budget mm -hmm. for you to live in Panama. And we show rentals and a lot of different price ranges and visit grocery stores so they see what they're like. And we go over the price for health insurance so they can come up with a realistic budget before they come. And I think that's one of the bigger challenges that people have is they know what they spend. Well, some people know what they spend where they live now, mm -hmm. but they're not sure what they're going to spend whenever they move and um, how much they're going to be able to take out of their investments to live on overseas. Let me uh, also follow up on your comment about what, what are people uncertain about or don't know about and certainly their investments what are they going to do with these investments that they have maybe they're used to using a localized bank or they have their brokerage account many of them have advisors that they've been working with for years yeah and most conventional advisory firms don't support an overseas address and so they it can uh, damage their ability to provide uh, ongoing guidance to to their clients so that's an area that we would walk them through what their options are and their considerations. So, um, you know, how to, how to think about and handle their investments and then also how to plan. You know, we do a lot of planning for our clients and how to, how to plan. The Is it sometimes necessary for them to move to a, a different investment company? Um, because some of them, they just don't want to work with people if they're, and so we don't even have addresses in Panama. So we don't have to worry about a Panama address. Um, but, you know, they know you're living overseas. Yes. So, And some companies, I think, don't want to work with people that are overseas. Why is that? Well, I'll, I'll comment on, I think, both of your questions here. Um, the, the easy answer to the question about, without getting into too much detail, about why most, you know, U.S.-based brokerage firms and, and advisory firms don't want to work with uh with people with overseas addresses is the regulatory requirements that are required for them to maintain those relationships and that's just like the simple answer and it's pretty much across the board for the most part yeah like fatca yes so fatca yes. had a lot to do with yeah. you know, impacting how advisory firms and and custodians when i say custodians i'm talking about firms that do the the provide the platform and do the bookkeeping for investment schwab fidelity right. or all those yeah, they don't really now. Now I got to Schwab will work with some firms 
Um, so many custodians and advisory firms simply aren't going to, you know, take on these these clients. Now, here's what a lot of people do is when they go abroad, they will not notify their broker that they're abroad. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people do that. And, uh, you know, they just maintain a U.S. address, a family member, a friend, or they, they have a place back there they didn't really sell. So that is what a lot of people end up doing. Now, I will also mention that, um, and these are generalizations. Well, some of them are, some of them aren't. But many banks continue to work with people with overseas address. Schwab does right. a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of these, a lot of these banks are set up to deal with people. Um, and I don't really get involved and we don't really get involved in managing our clients' banking relationships. Other right. than become aware of what they do and, and all that kind of, kind of stuff. But uh, interactive brokers is a very large global discount broker. I don't know if they're the biggest. They might as well be the biggest. I guess they're so huge. They'll work with people in virtually every country around the world. So man, that's kind of the default choice for many of our clients in using, you know, if, if they want to use an overseas address and um, and they need to have a brokerage account. And IB interactive brokers will support IRAs and inherited IRAs, brokerage accounts, those kinds of things. So they can handle many clients um, and a lot of our clients will use them, even though there are some complications along with IB as well. Yeah, I know some people that live in Panama, they say that when they're going to um, log into their retirement account, they always use a VPN to hide their to hide their location whenever they not not I don't not, I don't know if it does any good or not, but they do that just to try to be incognito as much as possible. Well, I can tell you what my experience has been on that. That um, and we we have a high volume business. We're we a lot of people. Um, I I used to think that a lot of the people that were doing that were being a little bit too paranoid. Yeah. But I think recently I'm getting a sense that some of the firms are doing a better job of diagnosing where clients might be interacting with them from. So um, I'm not suggesting that people need to use a VPN to log in, but my sense is there's a little bit more awareness of that from the custodial firms. And a, a lot of the people too that might, that might bring attention in this situation are going to be people that have much larger account balances, you know, right. five, seven, 10, 15, $20 million. So I think the, you know, the garden variety IRA at seven or $50,000 or, or 200 that I don't know that that would necessarily draw a lot of attention, but right. you know, I wouldn't tell any, I wouldn't tell somebody to not do that if they want to just, you know, use their. They'll their, sleep better at night. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So. Maybe they'll sleep better at night. Yeah. So um, whenever, when it's a retirement account that your company set up for you, whenever you retire, yeah. um, is there, can you keep that usually, or do you usually have to move it someplace else if you move overseas? Um, the, the answer would be almost the same as if they're just going to stay here in the States. Right. Um, many people, well, the advice that I would normally give to, a retiring person or person leaving work and not working anymore if they don't want to be called retired is that you can leave your money in the 401k fund. Most people prefer to roll it out to an IRA, an individual retirement account at that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, many times they can leave it with their prior employer and just leave it in the 401k plan. Um, and, you know, if they, so if they're going to go abroad, they can choose to leave it in the 401k or the 403b plan if they want to. And they may not need to update the address on it as well either. Now, I, I have not heard of any employer saying, oh, well, you know, you have an ad, you have an address in Thailand or um, Holland. So you have mm -hmm. to like get that money out. But I don't mm -hmm. really know that much anyway. Right. So and with some, whenever you get to a certain age, then you can start withdrawals from your retirement account. And a lot of people are counting on that for their income. Uh, to live overseas because they want to delay getting their social security until they're 70. So they're, that's bridging the gap uh, for them to be able to afford to live overseas. Is there a problem with that for expats to take a certain amount of money out? The, does the 4% rule, does that still work? <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> 
I, and you yeah, see that all over the place, the 4% rule. Yeah, yes. Yeah. For those that don't know what the 4% rule, it, it's, a, it's a relatively simple concept. And that is that if you retire and all you ever took out of your money was 4% a year. So if you had $500,000 and you took out 4% a year, that'd be $20,000. It would last forever. And like the balance would go down. Um, so you, you asked a couple of questions for one, or you made a reference to the 4% rule. Does it still apply? Um, I, I warn people about being a bit religious about that rule. Now, the older yeah. you are, I mean, the older you are, it just becomes less important. The 4% rule in my experience is kind of used by people that are more like these, these early retiree folks, the 37 year old, the 43 or whatever, they're going to, they're going to retire. And they, they will tend to use that has more of a hard number. Um, but I warn people, we don't know the future of the world. And if you're going to stick with this 4% thing and we have three years of really bad markets and we just keep doing 4%, you can be, yeah. you can be damaged by that. But yeah. And it depends on where you're going to live also. Yeah. Also, there's a lot of people that don't need to take out 4%. So look, don't take out 4% if you don't need 4%. Another exactly. important factor, I, we do a lot of plans. I've been doing this for a long time is that I, 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 when we do plans, we look at people's, what they think they're going to spend over periods of time. And most people tend to spend a lot less money once they get to a certain age. They get to be 75, 80, 84. Their consumption goes down. So for many people, you can take out 5 6% on certain years for a few years. It's likely not going to damage your plan too much. Now, you want to be careful. You want to be glib about the whole thing. Um, you, I, I think you asked me, I apologize, Jackie, but you had a prior question that was a part of that question. And I think it was about can you take money out of your 401k once you leave, like how would that work, right? Yeah, if you live overseas, is, does that complicate it if you're living overseas? Uh, Probably, maybe you would move, would you move the money? It, let's say you lived in the United States, would you move the money into US account then get access to it from Panama or wherever you were living? The, the account is likely, whether you keep it in your 401k mm -hmm. or you move it to an IRA, it's likely still a US-based account. So it's right. going to be in dollars in the U.S. And so now here, let's just talk through a situation. 62 year old, you know, they need $30,000 a year out of their out of their IRA. And let's just say they've, they've got enough in there and that's fine. You know, every month they could go to their IRA custodian. Let's just say it's Schwab and they could say, send me a check for $2,500 and it will go to their bank uh, out of the And may, maybe if it's in Schwab, it's going right over to their Schwab checking account. And then they just have to transfer their money to their However, they're getting it to their Panamanian bank. They, they right. can do that monthly. They can do that quarterly. It's not a problem, really, for most people, even if they're living in Panama or, for the most part, anywhere else in the world, to, to maintain your assets back in the U.S. and just receive the money periodically, whether it's monthly or quarterly or semi-annually. Uh, but it's probably better if that money doesn't go straight from your investment account to a Panama bank account. Is that right? It's likely that the custodian is probably not going to send it to a Panamanian. Now, I don't know. I, I guess if, if if you can receive it in U.S. dollars in a Panamanian bank. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Panama you, uses the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Now, you may not want to do it because you don't want to notify. Maybe what you're alluding to is the idea here that. Right. Well, hey, you know, you don't you don't need to bring attention to the fact that you're in Panama. So don't set it up. So it's going to your, your yeah. Panamanian bank. Yeah. So that's probably what you would end up doing is sending it to your bank, your U.S. bank, right. and, then, and then pulling. And it then, over. then you can use your AT, you know, your debit card yeah. to get access to the money, the ATM machine, or wire the money to Panama. But do that little in between. Now yeah. you have been, you've been a, you, how many years have you been down there now? Uh, Thirteen. Yeah, you. Uh, my suspicion, maybe maybe you would disagree with me is that you probably, it's probably getting easier and easier for you to do these kinds of transactions over the years. Yes. You know? yeah. 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 It's easier and easier because, uh, but you know, I just want to make sure that people don't have a hiccup whenever they get here. That's what we try to do and make it the whole move as hassle free as possible. And if all of a sudden they find out, Oh, I can't get access to my money, then what am I going to do? Um, so, you know, so yeah, well, a lot of what we provide guidance to is helping people prep for when they go somewhere else. And so like if they, 
they've asked me, well, what would I do? Or, or they asked me, what should we do? Should we, should we keep our accounts where we're at or should we open up interactive brokers accounts or what? And I would say, if I go abroad, I would just, it depends on where I go. I would open up an interactive brokers account and just use my overseas address and, and handle it that way. Then you don't, then you don't have to worry about using a VPN or yeah, uh, they're going to get a notice that they're going to shut down your account because you moved overseas or any of those things. Now it's not, it's a little bit funky slightly with interactive brokers in the sense that um, you can't own mutual funds inside your broker. And you can buy ETFs, which are fine. ETF exchange traded funds, which are fine. But if you had specific mutual funds that you owned in your brokerage account, you'd have to liquidate those and, and buy ETFs. And if it's not in an IRA or a Roth or a 401k, there could be some tax consequences. Yeah. I was going to say there could be some capital gains tax. Yeah. So you, so you have to be a little bit careful about those kinds of things. Right. And that's one of the things you advise people about at Plan Vision, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, but, yeah, our CPA, Jason, he does a, a part of his work is, uh, you know, running Roth conversion um, uh, models and does discussing with people tax loss harvesting, tax gain harvesting, those kinds of strategies. But yeah, we would definitely raise this as a, something to be aware of that right. you need this money. Now, it, you know, when people get to retirement, they're living off the money. So that's what you want to do. And it's okay to pay taxes. You know, you, you want to manage them accordingly, but um, you're going to be, you may have some gains and in, in income that you have to pay. Yeah. You know, we've had some people that have come on our tour and they moved to Panama and they didn't want to get their social security until they turned 70. So they're living off their retirement and they, um, they were living a more lavish lifestyle than perhaps the one that they left because, um, you know, they wanted that ocean view and the fancy three bedroom condo and all of those things. So they were kind of rolling through their money pretty fast and they resisted collecting social security. Instead, they would go back to the United States and go back to work um, until they turned 70, that they decided to do that. Okay. Basically, they were rolling through their money too fast. So what can Americans do to ensure that they don't run out of money? Do you help them come up with a plan on don't take out more than this? Um, for your money to last? Yeah, that's, um, that's a, a, a very common part of the work that we do. So I mentioned that we do planning for our clients. Right. And so for many people that are, let's just say 50 plus, 55 plus, even for younger folks, we do projections for them. And uh, we use a financial planning system, eMoney, which is an advisor-based program that we license and that we use it we use it with our clients and it's far more robust and sophisticated than just a retirement planning calculator so right. what we'll do with our clients is they'll enter their assets in there and what they're saving when they want to retire any pensions they have social security uh, how much they think they're going to spend if they have any assets they're going to sell anything like if they they want to sell their house and buy a place in panama or somewhere else we can we can do all those kind of, kinds of transactions and the system will pretty effectively actually calculate their taxes along the way too. But that's what we'll model with them is what mm -hmm. will be the appropriate spend rate that, right. uh, that they can do. Now we'll also talk about how they're going to behave. And so for many people, you know, they're going to say, well, you know, I'm 58 or I'm 60, 61. And for the next 15 years, that's the time of my life where I do want to spend more money. Mm -hmm. and enjoy myself, travel more, I'm more engaged with my family and in the community I'm living in. So we would project a higher spending level and then maybe drop it off at that point. Um, but that's all part of the modeling that we would do to give them some sense of how much risk they have in their plan and, and give them some peace of mind about spending. And we may also in, you know, discuss what's realistic, what's not realistic, you know, that sometimes their, ex, their aspirations or expectations are just not going to work. They're going to have to modify those. Right. Well, that's a really valuable service that you offer to people that are um, taking that transition from working, working, working to retirement and just being able to plan uh, financially on what to do, where to put your money, how much you can realistically take out without depleting the capital. Well, I've learned a lot by doing because we do so many of these about how people you know, think about or view their money and 
we have clients that it's, 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 it's interesting because we have clients that it's almost, they don't really realize how financially comfortable they are. They're too busy mm -hmm. engaged in their life and they're, a bit, right. they don't kind of get the numbers. And so they're, you know, they're, they're just not, they're, they can spend more money and they're, they're just uh, acting kind of silly, I think. And, and, and they're still being too frugal. Now it's hard for people to change. You know, if they've been good savers and have lived within their means to, to realize, oh, my gosh, we can spend a little more. On the other hand, we do have other folks that don't quite get it, that their numbers aren't working out. Mm -hmm. and they need to modify their plans, whether it's retiring earlier, their spending amount. Um, so, you know, you get people in all different situations. All different things. But it's a very gratifying part of our work because we can do this at a very low cost, very efficiently. And it's very clarifying for people. I know, um, like if I were to live in the United States, my monthly living expenses would probably be, I don't know, $10,000 a month, and where it's $1,000 a month in Panama if I own my house. So I just, you know, don't have very many living expenses. So some people um, may not realize it, but they could even retire early with the money right. that they have. Um, because if you move overseas, depending on where you move to, your cost of living could be so much less that it could enable you to retire five or 10 years sooner than you were anticipating, just taking into consideration the cost of living. Yeah. Yeah. And people, people just have such different, different and varying lifestyles and what they right. find satisfying and how, how they get fulfillment from. We have clients that can get by on a shockingly small amount of money, 24, mm -hmm. 30,000. And these aren't people living in Panama or Thailand, these are people living in the States. Now they're probably mm -hmm. not living in Manhattan or, you know, in LA or anything, but they're, they're, it's just how they conduct themselves. Right. And there are other people that have pretty high burn rate. <laughs> so yeah. it's just kind of what they do. Right. Um, so you mentioned, I know people are already wondering um, that you mentioned that you just have a flat fee for your service to help yeah. do this retirement planning. What's your flat fee? Yeah. So the way it works is people hire us for $239 for the first year. And, uh, and then after that, it renews at $8 a month and you can cancel any time. Yeah. And, the, and so we, in order to make this thing work, uh, there's a couple of important components that are part of the business model. One is we have to use technology efficiently. So for many of our clients, and a lot of them really like this, they say, oh, we have an onboarding survey. It takes them like three minutes to do. And it gives them us, it gives us a, a sense of what they wanted, like what they're going to do with us. Anyways, um, in the survey, we say to them at the bottom of the survey, so what do you, do you want an intro meeting or do you want to just get going with a plan? And if they say, well, I know I'm going to do a plan. Well, actually, we send them the link to eMoney. We send them this. We have a part of our websites of videos they watch on how they input all their stuff. And so they take ownership of that process. Now, we have very good tools they use to do that. Mm -hmm. But for us, they've that's a significant cost reduction for us that they do all this. So anyway, right. um, they load their stuff in there. And then we have typically two, maybe three planning sessions in the first three months, just depending upon their situation. And that's where we, we have a, like a session like you and I are having. It's a video session. I do a screen share. We walk through the numbers. They have a really nice client portal. So the cost covers the first 12 months. Um, and we, you know, we're typically more engaged in the first three months or so. But then after that, we're just available anytime they have questions. Right. $239 uh, to get started. That's super affordable. Well, we, <laughs> well, we think so. Uh, we've, it's, it's interesting because we work with ev everyone pays that same fee. Yeah. Like they have $20 million or if they're just fresh out of college. And for some people, that's a bit of a, a challenge, you know, to come up with that money. I mean, I've had, I recently had somebody ask me if we have a payment plan, which we don't, but um, you know, in, in the financial services industry, it's almost laughable uh, how, how that cost compares to other firms, but we think we're offering a tremendous value. Yeah. You know um, I did a lot of research about some of the different retirement and financial planners and um, your name kept coming up over and over again that, people respected, that they felt that they got a really good plan, that they feel they sleep better at night um, knowing that they have a handle on their finances. So that's why you got invited uh, to the show. And also my son, 
also used your services. Really? Yes, he did uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Oh, well, that's, yeah. that's I guess. I guess it is. And he, and he said you were great. So you got, you got the A plus really mark. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It, you know, you know, my, my job is a job, right? And so it has a fair amount of repetition to it. And so that can get to be monotonous for anybody in any kind of work. But financial advising, for most successful financial advisors, I think they find their work to be um, to be fairly low stress and by and large <laughs> for the most part. But it is, it is a lot of fun to work with expats, people moving around and in different parts of the world and all these different nationalities. So in fact, in my, my second hire that I brought into the company, uh, Jason, um, he was <laughs> he was very intimidated about the idea of working with expats. Oh my gosh, these people all over the place and different tax codes. And uh, now that's clearly one of the things he enjoys the most about the work is these people in different parts of the world, whether they're Americans or other nationalities. And I yeah. and I assume that that's something that people that move abroad enjoy well. It's just you interact with people from different parts of the world. Yeah, one of the good things about Panama is it has a territorial taxing system. So you're only taxed if you sell any products or services in Panama. So you wouldn't have to worry about double taxation yeah. in Panama on your retirement account. So that's a big plus for Panama. But that's something that if you're thinking about moving to a country, you need to research that um, and determine, you know, are you going to be taxed on um, any profit that you get from your retirement account? Yeah, I, I don't. You know, we don't do our clients' taxes, but we are aware of the tax implications of the decisions that they make. Right. I've interacted with some of the CPAs. Right, and that's something everybody needs to look at. And Panama, yeah. you don't have to worry about it because Panama's territorial taxing system. But um, if you're thinking about moving to a different country than Panama, then you definitely want to check that out and say what are the uh, the tax implications of moving to any country that you move to. I can comment on what I know about that. Is that um, when you're an American and you go abroad, you know, you, you may have a pension. Some people have pensions and you may have a 401k or an IRA. And that was money that you, you deferred taxes on mm -hmm. in the States. Well, you, you can't just go abroad and say, oh, I'm over here now. I don't have to pay taxes. You still will file a tax return unless you're you yes. know, American for the rest of your life. And you'll claim that on your on your U.S. taxes. Well, the U.S. tax system is, you know, it's it's in many cases the dominant tax system. It's interesting working with all these other expats from other parts of the world. They don't really have a lot of that reach that the U.S. does on it on on its, mm -hmm. uh, its uh, Americans that go abroad. So, but uh, there are plenty of expat tax advisors like the one you had on, and if you can find a good one, um, you know, that's very valuable. Right. Yeah, to really understand because it's a different world being an expat. Yeah. It's a wonderful world. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for some of us, it's not right for everybody. You know, for some people, it's just uh, living in Panama is not right for them or being an expat is not right for them. But for those of us that have taken the leap, I can't imagine living anywhere else. Yeah, it is unusual how some people just view that differently. My gosh, my, you know, there are people that don't leave their, their, 20 mile area for much of their life. And yeah. you know, there are people that grow up and they're very happy being close to friends or family. And that's just how they envision their life. And there right. are many other people that, that that just wouldn't work for them for whatever reason, they just need to see other parts of the world or they have a more adventurous, adventurous attitude. And that attitude doesn't stop when they're 55 or 60 or 65. So well, and even, you know, some people move to Panama and they live there for three or five years and oh, let's go to Portugal and move there for three or five years. And let's go to Mexico yes, and live there for no, three to no, five years. These nomadic yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of the expats that we work with, that's just kind of part of their program is they're going to, yeah. a lot of these teachers, they're going to take a gig somewhere for three to five years. And then they just, even they raise families and their children get used to it. It's just kind of the way of life. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So um, before I start taking questions from our audience, um, what other advice do you have for someone as far as retirement planning, if they're planning to become an expat? I suppose what I would, well, with regards to just to make a, a comment, 
Yeah. Think about your investment accounts and what you want to do with those. You, you can still maintain them. You can keep them at your current custodians and don't necessarily have to do anything. A lot of people, you know, get their statements electronically, even if they have a U.S. address. So there's that. But uh, now this is a message that I do share with uh, a lot of people. And this, you know, goes whether or not they're expats or not. And, 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 and my suspicion would be if they come down and spend time with you, that they, they like you would, you know, you, you're not going to do a budget with them individually, but you give them a taste of what it's going to be like, what it's going to be. Right. Have a good sense of what your expenses are going to be. And many times that's kind of overlooked because sometimes we tend to focus on our assets and our investments and how they're doing. But man, if people, if people are somewhat close, they're not sure how much they're going to have. You don't have to be religious about your budget, but having a really good idea of what you spend is pretty valuable when, particularly when you, travel, yes. you know, so yeah. I guess those would be a couple of comments that I would make, um, you know, and I, yeah. I, I suppose one of the things, I'm sorry, Jackie, but one of the things I would say to uh, people, that if your plan isn't amazing, if it's like an okay plan, something I do share with my clients, well, you know what plan B is, it's you get a job somewhere, you know, you'll make an extra five, seven, ten thousand $10,000 a year. So don't, you know, if, if you're running out of money or whatever, don't rule mm -hmm. that out, even though that may not be where you want to start. Right. And there's always online jobs. You don't have to go back to a regular job job. Um, online jobs are super popular these days. So I guess those are a couple of thoughts. Yeah. So now I'm going to take some questions from the audience, if that's OK. So if anybody has a question for Mark, please put three question marks in front of your questions so I can uh, quickly identify them. So I already have one question here from Dorothy. Um, if you use IBRK and give them your Panama address, will you now have to pay taxes in Panama on your capital gains, um, even though you may be invested in the U.S. stock? No, you wouldn't have to pay taxes in Panama uh, because well, it's a territory. Okay. Here's the way that I would answer that question. Because I don't really know. I, sometimes I do, but I don't really know the local taxes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. But um, I would usually say that um, if, if you, in the country that you live in, if you're an American, that you're going to have to pay, you, you may have to, your U.S. taxes as a retiree may be dominant over the country. Mm -hmm. Just depends upon the treaty. Now, in your case, Jackie, you know, you know the answer to that one better than I do, actually. It's, right. Yeah. Um, you're still going to have to pay taxes in the United States, definitely, but you're not going to have to pay taxes in Panama. And many um, retirees, they pay very little in taxes, actually, American retirees. You know, they don't, you know, depending on what their total income is, what their exemptions or allowances. And, you know, many, many retirees that are living off brokerage accounts or cash pay very little in taxes. Right. And, you know, expat taxes, paying taxes for an expat is a unique situation because you have to report your foreign bank accounts. Yeah. Um, if you've set up a corporation or foundation for buying real estate or setting up um, some of the visas require that, that has to be reported. So make sure that you also review the live stream that we did last Saturday with Bright Tax um, to understand what the, the taxes and the reporting are if you're a US citizen. And we also did one about a month ago with a Canadian uh, CPA that talked about the taxes in Canada, the pros and cons of becoming a resident versus a non-resident and all of those things. So review those previous live streams with, that we did to understand what you're getting yourself into uh, whenever you become an expat. Here's a good question from Denny. Is it too late to start a small investment plan if all of you, if all you get is social security? Well, no. Um, now, and something I'll mention too about interactive brokers, like if that's if you're in Panama and you have excess funds, when we do plans for our clients, we do projections for them. There are many retirees who each year have a surplus. So let's say they're spending $28,000 a year and they get Social Security, and maybe a pension, and maybe their investments kick out a little extra money. So their, their expenses are 28 and they're bringing in 34. Well, that's a little extra money they have. And in the plan, mm -hmm. we roll that over. And I say to them, look, you can put it in cash. Or you can just go invest it if you want to. So there are many people that will continue to invest. And it's relatively simple to do. Okay. 
Um, from Adam, could you use your funds in your Roth or I or, or 401k to meet Panama's friendly nation visa $200,000 deposit requirement? So let me answer that one because I know you're not familiar with the friendly nation visa. So the friendly nation visa is a new visa that started in August of last year. The requirements are that you either have to buy $200,000 worth of real estate or you can deposit $200,000 into a three-year CD in a Panama bank account that earns 3.5% or you can get a job in Panama. Last one doesn't sound like very much fun. So with the other one, so I believe um, you would need to check with the immigration attorneys, but I believe you could write a letter of investment uh, or direction with your 401k to invest in that CD in Panama. Maybe you can do that. Maybe you can't. Do you know if you can do that? Um, well, my a letter of direction to invest in a three-year CD in a Panama bank account. Well, my concern would be that if the if the holder of the Roth or the 401k, if they don't want to do the withdrawal, if they just want to like transfer it, like that's not going to happen. I don't see how the Panamanian bank would allow them to, to transfer to an IRA with them. So they would have to do a withdrawal of the 401k or the Roth. And that's if, taxable. On the 401k, on the, if it's a traditional 401k, now, if it's a Roth and they're over the age of 59 and a half and there's no five-year rule, they, they could conceivably take it all out and that would cost them nothing in taxes. And that mm -hmm. might be appealing to them. The trade-off is that they took money out of the Roth, which is the cherished retirement plan, um, to go do this, to, to make this deposit requirement. But on the other hand, it, you know, life is full of trade-offs and that might be a valuable one, depending upon how their assets are broken out. I guess what I would simply raise is the notion that if somebody's making a large distribution from an IRA or 401k plan, they just want to be aware of the um, tax red flag, tax red flag. Tax yeah. Taxes associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question uh, from Blake. Can you put investments into an LLC and have the LLC pay me a salary to manage the investments? Well, then take no, advantage of the board. And take I advantage work, of the foreign yeah, earned income for the IRS, but this sounds yeah. kind of bogus to me that yeah. there's not real work being done here. Yeah. Now, I don't know, you know, I mean, if you, if you're a tutor or you're, if you're doing work, then I think you could set up your own practice or whatever it happens to be. But I just don't think setting up an LLC, you know, Joe's LLC and then <laughs> claiming that that's foreign earned income, that's, I wouldn't go yeah. there with that. I have a better suggestion for you, Blake. If you go to our website, Panama Relocation Tours, and in the upper right-hand corner in the search feature, type in fund, F-U-N-D, your freedom overseas. Get my free ebook about ways that you can have an online business to earn some income that would qualify for that foreign to earn income exclusion. And in January, we're going to have a special live stream about how to do domain name flipping, which is something I've been doing for 20 years. And it's a great way to earn uh, money that you could um, qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. So it's better to um, keep everything on top of the table and nothing under the table, um, I've always told people. So check out the online uh, opportunities for making money. Another question for Megan, for those with defined benefit pensions with a monthly surplus, are there special considerations or recommendations? No, not, not, I mean, just by being virtue of an expat, not really. Um, just make sure that you're, wherever that money's being paid to, that you can access that money and use it. But no, there shouldn't be any special considerations for that. Okay, so someone else was asking you know, how to get in touch with you. So I'm going to put your website up here, right here. So it's no, Plan, no. Vision, Plan Vision MN. Is that right? Yeah, I used to live in Minnesota. So I had to use that, but now we live in North Carolina. You got tired of too much snow. Is that right? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> I saw in the news that New York has had like six feet of snow. Oh, my goodness. I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, we guys are down there, right? But it's, yeah, it's actually been wonderful for me and my family. My our daughters are doing well, but we've had a cold snap here. It's been, 
you know, the upper twenties and low thirties. And I can't even tolerate that now. It's um, I, I, I'm just so tired of the winners up there. So. Right. Um, so this is a question for Jackie. If I bought a condo for 200,000 and it was in my son's name, would that qualify him for the permanent visa? Um, so I think that they need to know where the funds are going to come from. But yes, if, if your son were to buy a $200,000 condo and it was titled in his name exclusively, then that would qualify you for the friendly nation visa. Yeah. Just, it, that sounds to me like something that's a gift too. Yes. Yeah. So you just want to make sure that you like the gift tax, there's a little tax. There's a little, I don't think you'd actually pay tax in and of itself on just doing that but you want to record that on your taxes, but I'm not a, like a gift tax person. So. Yeah. So uh, for people who are still working, do you yeah. help them decide when it makes sense to take social security or they're to buy or rent, et cetera? If it, or is it, is that, yeah, this is all, those are all pretty standard parts of our re. I mean, we cover a lot of questions with our clients. Yeah, and you know, the sooner the the sooner you start retirement planning, you know, in your twenties and thirties is not too soon. Um, the sooner you start retirement planning, the more secure you're going to be. So many people, you know, I think I've read statistics. The, the majority of people that are age fifty five, they don't have any retirement savings. They've done no retirement planning, and retirement is looking at them right down the road. They can see it right down the road, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, what am I going to do?" Um, so the sooner you get started, the better. Yeah. And uh, as a part of that process, just for us, and, and I would say for most advisors too, I would hope that they can provide guidance on how to make the social security decision, the pros and cons, whether to buy or rent, you know, other, you know, decisions, um, you know, does it make sense to sell a property, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So that's included in your oh, service. Yeah. yeah, that's, this is pretty common. That's wonderful. Um, so let me see another question here. Uh, Donald, will my recently formed trust be recognized in Panama if I and my wife both died? Um, no, your trust would not be recognized in Panama. You'd have to have, Panama doesn't have trust law, so you'd have to have a will and Panama or a foundation is what they use that's similar to a trust. But if you lived in Panama, you need a Panamanian document, your US documents not recognized. Now it could mirror um, the same stipulations that you have in your trust, but that the actual trust from the US would not be recognized. Yeah, we don't know much about that. <laughs> that's what we've heard yeah. from and it can get a little dicey Family. Yeah. And your immigration attorney can help you yeah. with like the Panamanian will. If you get it in Spanish only and you have to sign something that you understand what it says, um, then it's only like $250. If you have it translated with a certified translator, so it'll be like one paragraph in Spanish, one in English, one paragraph in Spanish, one in English, it's $600 for that will and you sign it in front of a notary and they actually take a picture of you signing your will and they keep that. So nobody can say, I don't think they really signed it. Um, <laughs> it's just one of the things that they do in Panama. There's all kinds of quirky little things. So another question that came up, let me go back up here. Nope, we already had that question. Never mind. So I'm going to take that question off. So one other, um, I wanted to bring up again, this is the website for Mark. It's planvisionmn.com. And if someone wanted to set up a session with you, is there a place on their website where they here's, just here's what fill happens. out something? You go to that website, and we have eight one-minute videos, eight or seven. And you watch those. It describes our model. Then we say, hey, go read our FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. And mm -hmm. then you buy our service. Now we do offer a 60 day money back guarantee, but we don't do intro sessions. I gave up those four years ago. Um, so you buy the service and then you fill out this onboarding survey and then we go from there. And then most of our clients, most of our clients, well, I shouldn't say most, uh, we have a wide variety of clientele as far as what they needs are, but most of them will set up an intro session 
And then, um, but a lot of them will just jump right into the planning with the e-money. So, but that's the process. And we explain that on the website. And I'm sure the process all starts with, you know, here's some things you really need to think about, you know, and kind of how much money you're going to need to live yeah. on and other, other kind of things that you need to kind of figure out before you even start your planning session. Yeah, we, we have uh, some information on the website about what people are looking for. Okay. Let me go back over here to the questions. Once again, if anybody has a question for Mark, just put three question marks in front of your question. So another question that came up was if someone just has, they don't have any investments in 401ks or IRAs, but they have rental property. And can you still give them advice about, you know, how to handle the distribution of or what to do with that income from rental property? Well, that rental property is a source of income for them. Right. And so uh, we, we have a few clients that are real heavy on rental properties. And so I, for some of these people, what they will say, well, I'm 55 or 58, like whatever they happen to be saying, I'm not going to hold on to these things forever. So we can discuss with them, when do you want to offload these things and what will the cost be? But yeah, it's fairly easy for us to do models for people that have, multiple businesses, if they have several properties that can all be integrated into the plan and we can discuss how you're going to live off this money and pay the bills. Good idea. And you know, part of that um, could be when perhaps to liquidate some of those yeah. rental properties and consolidate them. If you have, let's say 20 rental properties and 10 of them are free and clear and 10 of them have um, debt on it. Um, you may want to get some of, get a, as many of them, without debt as possible. And what's the right timing for doing that? Timing the capital gains tax. Yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it's the idea that, look, these things produce income for us and they can provide us a quality of life, but we don't want to do this till we're 85. So right. we're, we're going to have to figure out what's that going to be. And that injection of cash from the sale can be very valuable to them later in life, more so yeah. than the ongoing. Yeah, income. you know, like sell one property every five years and that takes care of your living expenses for yeah. five years, or maybe even sell it with seller financing and still get the monthly income, but nobody's gonna call you in the middle of the night saying their toilet yeah. stopped up. Yeah, exactly. um, so there's all kinds of ways if you have rental property. Mm -hmm. There are. Yep. So another question that came up, do you provide investment advice? Yes. Yeah, so let me uh, clarify what that question, what, what we think that question is. Uh, mm -hmm. We think when people are asking that question, they're asking us, where should I invest my money? Like how much right. stocks or bonds should I have treasuries, CDs, those kinds of things. That is a primary part of the app of, of, of the guidance that we provide is now many people that hire us, they don't need that or they don't even want that. They want more planning help. They're comfortable with their investments. But I would say most of the people that, that engage us do, some of them want, some of them want us to tell them what to do with their money. That's fine. Other folks want a second opinion, but investment guidance and advice is a pretty standard part of our uh, interaction with our clients. And you know, I guess part of that has to do with, um, do you want to invest your money for rapid growth or do you want to invest your money for it being as safe as possible? Um, or yeah, you know, that's a part of the conversation. All How kinds of things have? that you have to consider. Yeah, what what other assets do they have? What has what have they been comfortable with in the past? How do they view their money if they're transitioning to not working anymore? Um, so we'll integrate that in the conversation and uh, mm -hmm. you know make recommendations. So, Mark, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this live stream and sharing the information about your incredible service. There's $239. Um, you help people figure out their retirement planning and financial planning. Um, a lot of people, I think, have been afraid to even approach a financial planner or a retirement planner because the cost were they were afraid that the costs were going to be too high. Not checking into it, but just they just assumed that the cost was going to be too high. So I know it's going to be very refreshing for, for people to find out that they can get really good advice um, at a really affordable price from someone that's been in the industry for 20 plus years. Yes. Um, you know, we, we think the industry has a great space for something like this. And so we're yes. delighted to be filling it. So thanks for your time, Jack. It's uh, been a long yes. time. Thank you so much, Mark.
All right. Have a good evening. Yep, you as well. Yep. And thank you, everybody that joined us for our live stream um, with this interview about retirement and financial planning. I hope you found it very valuable. We'd love to hear uh, your comments um, underneath the video. Have a good weekend, everybody. Goodbye.